You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Before we get started, our usual reminders about upping our followers on Instagram and Twitter and subscribers on YouTube. Want to get to a thousand in each of those categories. Look, that's not like a big number. We really need to grow this community and we need your help to do it. So if you can send a message to a friend, hey, go follow the Hazard Ground on Instagram and on Twitter, and make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. That way we continue to grow, we continue to get these stories out to more people, and furthermore, like this week's guest, we get people who are willing to come forward and tell their own story. That's really what we find most powerful and what we get a lot of appreciation that we have listeners who are willing to step forward and say, hey, I have a story to tell. And we know that sometimes telling these stories is really good for the people who are telling them, And because everything that veterans go through and what the epidemic is right now with suicide, we love the fact that people are willing to come forth and tell their story. So if we can grow this community, grow this Hazard Ground podcast followership, we certainly hope to impact some more lives. Speaking of impacting lives, our Amazon partnership has been doing that. Go to our website, hazardground.com. Click on the Amazon banner at the bottom of the homepage or go to the Sponsors tab. You'll find it there. But every time you do your Amazon shopping, if you go through hazardground.com first, we'll get a percentage of what you guys spend. And then we will donate that percentage back to some of the great charities and foundations you've heard featured here on the Hazard Ground Podcast. With all that out of the way, let's get on to another great episode. Joining us this week is a listener who has a story to tell, which we always love. He is a retired specialist in the United States Army who was a combat engineer. He had one deployment as an engineer in the Army overseas and a second one as a contractor. He was wounded in Afghanistan, received a Purple Heart for his actions. He is Terry Wilson joining us on the Hazard Ground Podcast. Terry, welcome. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Thank you for having me, and thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. Well, certainly, thank you for being a fan of the show. Uh, We are always excited when listeners kind of raise their hand and say, hey, I'd love to tell my story, because that's what we're here, you know, why we do this and why this podcast exists is to tell those stories. So we're we're excited when when fans kind of put their hand up and say, hey, I got got a story to tell, and definitely want to hear that. Um, Let's start at the beginning for you, though. How'd you get into the Army, and why? Um, so, uh, funny that you should even mention that. So originally I was going to be a Marine. Uh, my brother was Marine. I was going to follow in his footsteps and I was in the delayed entry program for 363 days in the Marine Corps. And I was going to be Intel and my brother, he was at my high school graduation and he was like, Hey, you know, uh, let me go ahead and look at your contract. And he started looking through my contract and, he was an E5 in the Marine Corps at the time, and he had just got back home from Iraq, his first deployment, and he started looking at my contract, and he's like, oh, you're open contract instead of Intel. And I started looking at it, and I was like, well, yeah, it does say open contract there, but hey, my recruiter said that, hey, they'll straighten out all that when I get to MEPS the second time, and they'll handle that at Paris Island. And um, he was like, no, that's that's not how this works. You'll, you'll be a cook or you'll be whatever they want you to be versus what's on your paperwork. So, uh, backed out of that, um, said, Hey, I'm not going to be a Marine. Um, you can take that and shove it basically. Um, because I wanted a certain job and they weren't going to guarantee it. And, um, took a lot of flack from the recruiters, took a lot of flack from the command of the recruiting at the time. And they said, well, you're never going to be a Marine and all this. I was like, well, I'll never be a Marine Intel. That's for sure. So I don't really care. And, um, moved to Jacksonville, North Carolina to spend the summer with my brother at the time. I uh, just enjoyed the summer basically, um, having fun. And then, uh, in August of that year, I decided to join the army reserves and go to college. So joined the Army Reserves in August of 2006 and started going to college. The first semester went great. Hey, all the paperwork was fine. And then the second semester, um, that, that following spring, it, like the, they could not get their paperwork straight. I had to have a degree plan. I had the vice president of the school make my degree plan, send it into the Army 
it wasn't good enough. Um, just all kinds of issues logistically with this person didn't sign off on the right paperwork, so they're not going to be covering my tuition. I'm not going to be getting my BAH as an E5, like blah, blah, blah. I mean, it was a big circus just to try to even get that. So I said, you know what? Fuck, it. you know, I'm, I'm out. I'm not going to do this college thing. I'm just going to go and get a job and do whatever and be a reservist. Not that big of a deal. Other people are doing it, so I'll do that. So didn't even go to school you, doing the tuition assistance thing. And then um, it was um, long story short here is just I backed out of going to school, be a, just a regular reservist, do my one week in a month, two weeks a year, and call it a day. Um, joined the Army as a 21 Juliet, which is general construction engineer, because it was the fastest MOS. I think we had it in five weeks at the time. So you get in there, you do your – high X, your C truck and your crane and you call it a day and you leave. All right. So you start out as an engineer. Are you ever worried about combat? Do you ever think you're going? I mean, did you feel like it was a fait accompli that you would ever end up there? Uh, not really. Uh, I knew that my unit, the 441st or 467th at the time was, had just got back from Iraq and they were just doing this deal with, Demob and coming off the rotation, going into training and all that. So I wasn't really too worried about it. I mean, we weren't doing anything besides suicide prevention classes at the AT and PFTs and not just general demo stuff because most of them were the combat engineers already and I wasn't. Um, and then I think in 2008 or 2009, they made me uh, switch MOSs to be a – Gen or a super echo so i became a super echo which is said hey you're going to operate the dozer grader and other piece of equipment and i said okay cool so i got that mos and then about three months later they said hey if you don't want to become a combat engineer you're gonna have to start driving like 120 miles south of where i was already drilling at and i said well no i'll just take the 12 Bravo route or 21 Bravo route, which is a combat engineer. And I'll just become a combat engineer too. So I have three MOSs, whatever. Um, so went up to, I think it was like somewhere in Indiana for two weeks and started learning how to do demo stuff and blowing stuff up. And that's how I became combat engineer. And then, um, that's how that loaded up. But to get back to your question, I never really thought combat was going to be a big deal or even, an issue because, hey, you know, I'm a reservist. I'm not going to have to worry about that stuff. The war's already gone and all of that, you know. Sure. So when do you first hear about the idea that you guys may deploy? Um, whenever we were at Fort McCoy, Wisconsin, um, we were doing our two-week drill up in Wisconsin. And then First Sergeant had us do uh, – Formation at like seven o'clock at night or nineteen hundred, and it was out in the middle of a field. I mean, I remember the, this formation quite vividly. And uh, first sergeant got up and was like, "Hey, um, just so you know, we are alerted. Um, we are officially alerted." And I was like, well, "What the hell does that mean?" You know, and we're, everybody's like, "Yeah, and like, hey, we're going." You know. I'm like, what does alert mean? And we had a few guys in the unit that were like, oh, man, are you serious? Because they're about to get out. <laughs> and now then they can't get out of the unit. So right. we're all here. We're all going. Um, and then um, basically he said, hey, you know, we don't know where we're going yet, but we, we've been put on a list that we might go. So nobody's allowed to get out of the unit. People can come in, but they can't leave. Nobody can retire. Um, nobody can be discharged, blah, blah, blah. And that's how I initially found out. Um, this is a two part story because the second part is whenever we actually got the word of, Hey, I think it was December, December's drill that, that year. Um, we had a different formation. It was in a classroom in Millington, Tennessee on base there. And first one, Started, uh, he said, Hey, everybody, take a seat. And if I say your name, go ahead and stand up. And 
as he was reading all the names, we were standing up and he got down to the W's and called Wilson. I was like, oh man, so what's going on with all the people that are standing up? And he, cause like I'm at the bottom, he's like, all right, well, um, these are all the people that are going, go ahead and congratulate them and say, good luck in Afghanistan. They're going to be laterally <laughs> transferred to the 323rd in South Carolina and they're going to be going over. And then uh, I'll never forget what happened next. Um, first Arn took a second, uh, flipped a piece of paper over, signed his name and said, if you want to volunteer and go with them, here's the list. And his name was at the top. And I was like, wow, that's pretty awesome. And it was really amazing to see the brotherhood there because almost everybody, like, they want to go with us. Like, that was pretty awesome. How, so how many do you know how many people signed up, like, percentage-wise? Um, I would say at least 80%. Now, what were the uh, other What were the some, other 20% doing? Were people looking at them sideways? Uh, not really because some of them just had kids. Some of them had work obligations, and there was no – qualms if they didn't sign it's just hey i understand it's okay interesting yeah so, because i mean it was some of them, i mean there was a few that had just had kids and there was one of them that was about to get out like it was like hey i i, I want to go but at the same time like i'm ready to start my life like i've already hit my 20 like just let me get out <laughs> well that's weird um you know, I, I wonder, and, and for the civilians listening, you know, that's uh, there's a lot of people who would look at those who didn't sign up with a little bit of a side eye. Um, you know, it's it's a tough, tough thing when you are a reservist and, you know, you have a full-time job and you have, you know, other responsibilities that aren't Army 24-7. You know, the, the, the thing we talk about, you know, the National Guard and the reserves, you know, you're a citizen soldier, a citizen first and a soldier second. And so... Well, I understand the people who made that decision, and I don't look poorly upon them for choosing their life over a deployment because, like, hey, deployments aren't fun, you know? Um, I just, you know, there, there may be some people who didn't vocalize it, but certainly were sitting there looking at some guys going, what the hell is wrong with you? Are you fucking serious? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that, I mean, I, I just, you know, I was wondering if anybody had openly said anything. Uh, I don't remember that, honestly, and... Uh, one of the things that we knew at the time was we were going to be the redheaded stepchild to another unit yeah. out of South Carolina. And that's what we did know. So uh, what I mean by that is we were going to help fulfill another unit that wasn't up to 100% capacity. So I think they were probably 85% up to mission standard and we were going in there to fill in all the slots to help them get to a hundred percent. So we were only going to be four to five people per platoon or so, maybe mm -hmm. seven or eight in some platoons filling in slots. So when we got to that unit and we were told, Hey, well, for my example, I've been sick on the platoon. I only knew like five or six people in my platoon. So of those people that I knew, not all of them I actually got to go and be in the same platoon with. Okay, gotcha. All right, so you guys are find out you're heading to a South Carolina unit. Any apprehension there? Any sort of like, you know, uh, fear or worry about how that's going to go? Or is there more fear and concern about just going to Afghanistan in general? Um, so we get to South Carolina in January. We actually have boots on on the ground in Afghanistan, June 6th or somewhere in that range. Um, so we have this pre mob mob and all, tr all this train together up at, again, Fort McCoy, Wisconsin, that place. Um, it's in the winter time. We got to do a lot of training with them and we got to know, Hey, you know, these are the people that we're working with. We got to train with our LT, train with our students, aren't train with, all the leaders, you know, so we got some really good leadership there. I mean, the, my platoon sergeant or my squad leader, and we had a few E6s at the time when we pick up E7 during deployment that was actually from the Tennessee unit, which I think was a good thing because now then we actually have somebody that can stick up for us a little bit higher on versus just the lower enlisted. 
which that's what I was. Um, but I feel like the cohesion was pretty good by the time we got to Afghanistan. All right. So when do you actually arrive in Afghanistan? What's your mission? What are you told? Uh, we were told we were going to be doing route clearance. We knew that from the get go. Um, route clearance is not necessarily a fun and lucrative business for the soldiers. It's really not. It's one of the most scariest jobs you can ever imagine. I know you've talked to uh, Zach Stinson, mm-hmm. who lost both of his legs. Um, it's really scary. Um, but we were going to be mounted route clearance versus unmounted, which means that we were going to be in trucks versus on foot. So that was a plus. Um, but still, nonetheless, we're dealing with bigger IEDs, so it, the risk is still the same. Did you feel, and I remember these from my first deployment, those big buffaloes, they kind of look like, uh, you know, uh, I can't describe what the vehicle looks like. It was almost just like a, a truck that was a, the letter A, you know, like on wheels at the bottom that rolled yeah. and had these arms that sort of reached down to the ground. But uh, Yeah, so I, I was driving that. I, I remember seeing those things and going, oh, well, that's creative. I don't know if it'll, it, it'll keep you alive, but it looks creative. Um, so yeah. uh, how did you feel about being inside those vehicles? Did you feel like they were designed well enough to keep you safe and alive? Yeah. Uh, when we were training up in Wisconsin, we were driving a five ton converted to a training Buffalo, which was interesting. I mean, it had, it had the arm on it. It had everything that the normal Buffalo would have, but it was just a cheaper model of it. And I was in charge of driving it along with my co-driver, Alan. And when we, we got to Afghanistan, I mean, we felt really well prepared to be there. Um, we also had a backup arm operator and then we had Ioka in there and then we had the truck commander as well. And I mean, we felt really prepared with our mission at hand, but you know, when we got to Afghanistan and we got, we fell in on our truck the first time we we're like, yeah, this truck is nice. Like, cause we fell in on a brand new Buffalo A2 and it was ours. It was ours, you know? All right. So as you're doing route clearance, um, are you working with infantry units or other units there? I'm just kind of trying to get a scope of how, what the operational tempo was like. Um, so when we first got to Afghanistan, we flew into Kandahar airfield. We got off the plane and it smelled like shit because of the shit pond there. And, um, we were told, okay, well, a, hey, um, uh, your trucks aren't here and you're not going to be in Kandahar. You're going to actually be up in Jalalabad working out of Jalalabad, which is, if you're familiar with Afghanistan, that's like all the way up east, northeast, and Kandahar is down south. So what we see down here, Kandahar is not what we're going to be clearing. We get up to Jalalabad and about a week or two later, and it's a lot different. It really is. The atmosphere there is hot. I mean, it was god-awful hot. It was 120, 130 we would sweat through our boots before we even got to the motor pool. And when we got on the route, when we started doing left seat, right seat with the platoon or the company we were swapping out of, it was, okay, I'm right seating or co-driving the Buffalo driver here. And it was like, man, this is the route? We're clearing this? Like, what needs to be cleared here? And I was asking him, hey, how many strikes have y'all had? And he said, none. And like, so why are we driving a buffalo in the mountains of Afghanistan when there's a cliff face right there? <laughs> like, to put it in perspective, I mean, the movie uh, Lone Survivor does a really good job of painting the picture of what it looks like in Afghanistan sure. in the north. Yeah, it's, and, it's all mountains. Yeah, it's mountains. Like, people don't think that, yeah, that's what it looks like, but that's really what it looks like up there. and. But there's roads that go on the side of the cliff like you're going through the Blue Ridge Mountains of Tennessee where you have cliff on one side going straight up a road and then a drop off on the right that goes into a river. Like, And you're sitting here thinking logistically, why would anyone want to bomb this road? Because if they bomb this road, their citizens aren't even going to have supplies for months or years. Right. Because they can't just rebuild this road with their technology. 
what month and year do you actually arrive there? I just want for the audience sake of, of understanding. Um, I get there June 2010. Okay. And so you're set for a year long deployment at this time, correct? Uh, nine months, nine months of deployment. Really? Yeah. I kind of got hosed. Um, I went in 2011 yeah. for a whole year. <laughs> well, so when we were leaving Afghanistan in that March, there were people there that said, all right, so we're here for 18 months. Who wants to go ahead and set up their leave dates now? Wow. All right. So you get there in June. Take me through kind of day-to-day life there. Uh, what did you deal with? What did you see? Set the scene for everybody. Uh, so when we get there to Jalalabad, uh, day-to-day life, uh, when we weren't going out on missions, we were actually going to the motor pool, which if anybody's familiar with Fod Fenty, it's an airfield, and it's about a 3.1, 3.2-mile loop around the airfield. And we were staying on the other side of the airfield from the DFAC, so we had to actually walk across the airfield and go all the way down to the motor pool, which was about a one-and-a-half-mile walk. Um don't forget anything because you have to walk back and it's hot. We would normally take uh, two or three water bottles with us just to make the walk to the motor pool at seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, we were doing maintenance on the vehicles. I personally was driving around the 3.1 mile loop in the Buffalo, just getting hours in, getting more comfortable with the vehicle, knowing the turning radius, knowing how it maneuvers, where my blind spots are, how I can see, do I need to adjust the mirrors, doing all that stuff just to be a better driver. Um, then um, we were also doing arm, arm operations. So the arm operator would say, hey, you know, I want to play with the arm, just getting out there playing with it, getting more familiar with the actual arm that he's messing with, the controls of all that. Um, we also did light kits and installation on there. So we installed light kits and that was just a nightmare. I mean, that was probably the longest day of my life. And right. I'll never forget, uh, commands are major, uh, B- Bito, Bento, something like that with the 101st. He was in charge of five Fenty, and man, he was a dick. He had the dang police or, yeah, the basically the five police go around to the motor pool, and if you didn't have your weapon within arm's reach, you got a ticket. And I'm like, okay, what's your ticket gonna actually do? Like, what are you gonna are you gonna send me home? That's what I'm thinking. Uh, okay, send me home. All right, but we had to have our weapon within the arm reach all the time, even if we were doing maintenance on the vehicle, along with clear eye pro, and we also had to have our um our top, our blouse on with our Velcro cinch, like, because we were in ACUs, like it, we couldn't, no matter how hot it got, we had to uphold the professional appearance of the army. Yeah. And I'm sitting here thinking, doesn't he know we're in Afghanistan and it's hot as hell outside? So like, just need something now. to do. It's kind of what they do. I mean, it's, it's the yeah. uh, nature of the beast to say the least. How, how much were you operating outside the wire? Uh, when we got to five venti, we were doing probably two, three day missions a week. I think we might have had one or two longer missions where we would go all the way down to. There was a fob at the end named Hazimadad, and there was one past Hazimadad on Route California, and that was just the longer day missions where we would just go longer and longer. And those are turned into probably a week or two long missions. And then we did one mission that I'll never forget. We went down to this castle and like we got to the castle and I was like, wow, that was pretty cool. And we were at elevation. It was like Gazi or something like that. And we got there and um, we had a, weird formation again i'm like man these weird formations they never are a good thing and then they say hey pack up all the stuff and we're leaving tomorrow to go back to finchy to pack and we're gonna be heading down south i'm like oh cool so they're just gonna fly us down south give us new trucks and we'll be fine but i didn't realize like they meant pack up everything on a 916 into shipping containers and we're driving down south 
So we did the road trip from Five Fenty all the way down to Five Ramrod, which is on the border of the Kandahar province and the Hellman province. We were about three miles away from that line of Hellman and Kandahar on Highway 1. So how far of a, of a convoy was that? Um, it took us at least two weeks, if I remember right. Oh, I mean, really? Maybe a week. Um, well, we were going 30 miles an hour. And if you imagine going from Washington, D.C. down to New Orleans, that's about the how long it would take. And we were driving big buffaloes and huskies and MRAPs. And we had to stop at every fob along the way. And sometimes they'd have us do route clearance operations around there. And, I mean, we got to see the countryside. I guess that's nice, right? Eh, not really. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when you start, you move south, does your mission set change? Um, yes. So it, uh, at that point, we have a rotating basis of where we're all going, and we're all doing the same route clearance operations in about the same area. So... We have four platoons that are doing rotations, and then we have a maintenance platoon on top of that to help with maintenance. And we would have, like, say, second platoon would go out. Well, that means third platoon would be pulling back up for us or some rotation where another platoon that just got back was pulling back up if something goes bad, and then the other two are off. And then we would just go through the rotation. So that way, when we be out, we'll be basically, um, I'm drawing a blank on what the name is, but basically they're the ones that help go out real quick. Um, there's a name for that, but I forget that name. Okay. So take me through life in the South then. How are things different? <laughs> uh, there's a lot of sand. There's a lot of dirt. Um, so... One of the things that happened, I just found my notes here, uh, on September 26th. So we have all of our crap with us, all of it. And we have, we get tasked with doing some route clearance on the way, which is normal, not a big deal. So we have our laptops, we have all of our personal effects with us in the trucks that we're in. And if it's extra stuff like foot lockers with your mop gear, whatever it might be, stuff that you're probably not going to use, you can just put it in the shipping container that's on the 916. And the 916 is just going to be going from fob to fob, nothing else. So it's a little bit more secure, but you still have all your stuff. And on September 26th, um, we get tasked with going to fob terminator, which um, is where we uh, just hang out for the night. And then they're like, oh, no, well, you're going to go ahead and you're going to go do this route clearance real quick. And it was put to us by our LT, like, hey, we're just going to go down this um, dried up riverbed real quick, go down here, turn around, and come back. It's only two miles long. We're just going to go down there, clear it, come back, we'll be back, and then we're going to go down to Fob Ramrod. Easy peasy. Well, um, during the night, it actually shifts of what actually um, happens with my deployment and my perception of the deployment. And what I mean by that is uh, during this little bit of a route clearance, it was called the Super Wadi. And we clear this route We and the Huskies up front. No, no, the Huskies stayed back. It was just the mine rollers up front. So it was my best friend's truck, Littles. He was up front with a truck behind him, and we were in the Buffalo. The Buffalo took an ID strike. This was my first strike, and it was just like a 80, 90-pounder. It didn't even do damage to the truck. It messed up some of the gauges for a few minutes, and then they all settled back down. And we were fully operational still. And then we continued on down the road. There was a turn in the road, and this was at night. So we were doing route clearance at night for whatever reason. But we all had these lights, like Christmas lights on the trucks. We, I see the 
two one or yeah two one alpha turn right going down the road, and then we hear this explosion, and at the time I'm like, man, that was really loud. Like I, I've never heard like an IED strike before this one in person, and it was just like this big boom. Like imagine a firework souped up a few times and then going off sideways. That's what it looked like to me because it threw flames and sparks to my left. Like my, from, I looked at it and I saw the truck and it it just went from the bottom right of the truck all the way to the top left of the truck and onward. And I was like, man, that's big. And then, all right. So LT uh, two six is like, Hey, two one alpha, give me a sit rep when you can. And no reply. I'm like, okay. So they're getting their backup mics. They're getting their backup uh, radios. All right. Hey, two six, give us, or two one, give us a sit rep when you get a chance. No reply again. So we wait two, three minutes because we're all like, hey, death before dismount number one. And if there's a primary IED, there's probably a secondary IED for us. Sure. So don't, don't get out and walk around because chances are there's another IED that we don't see. So, um, no reply goes by for a little bit. And then, um, we get up there. We, uh, the Buffalo was told to go up there and shine the lights up there to see what's going on to see if they're okay. So I get up there, I turn the light around and I see the truck, uh, shine the Buffalo's arm down there so we can control the light. And meanwhile, it's a catastrophic hit. It's completely blown up. Um, at this point, like I lose a little bit of time here in my mind. Next thing I know, there's two other trucks up there. Everybody's walking around. And then my best friend, Littles, he is on a gurney on the bottom of the side of the Buffalo. Cause I'm on the top of the Buffalo looking down and I see him on a gurney and I'm like, Whoa, is he dead? Is my best friend dead? Like, that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, whoa, they're playing for keeps. Like, when, this is real. When you say it was catastrophic, describe what you saw when you rolled up there. Um, the mine roller and the front of the truck was no longer attached to the truck. Um, the front wheels, the front of the mine roller is all one unit, and that was separated. The all the windows on the RG were uh, shattered. These are six inch windows. So imagine having a six inch pane of glass and all of that being shattered. Um, all of the stuff inside was just blown around. The gunner, Collie, he was shook up. And I'm like, man, if I would not want to be a gunner with that. I'm like he had a lot of concussion there, you know? And, the boat, the RG was sideways on the road, and the mine roller was on another side of the road, and there was just a big hole in the earth. Like, I say big hole, probably eight, nine feet deep. You could stand in it and not see the top. Like, it was big, and it was all black. All of this was black from what I remember. Okay. Um, you start to talk about how this became real. What are the feelings and the emotions you have behind that? Um, first was anger. I was like, man, fuck these motherfuckers. Like, I want to get some revenge for them because now then it's like, man, these are, these are people that are really trying to hurt me and my friends now. Like, that's when it became personal because it's real to me. And it's like, yeah, we're just doing a route clearance, blah, blah, blah. Nothing's really happening. But whenever you get hit with that first strike, it's like, oh, wow. Okay. Um, a little bit more on that night though. Uh, so we get up there, we call the medevac in for them. The medevac comes and gets Collie and Littles, which is the gunner and the driver of 2-1 Alpha. And then next thing we know, 2-5 gets hit from behind us. So 2-5 was moving up to pull security on us, and they get catastrophic hit. Well, Others are on the ground. So we're still in the super wadi. People are on the ground. And 2-5 gets hit. 
I was on the ground in the middle of the field pulling security in, in the marijuana field. And here I see two five get hit. And next thing I know, I just lay down real quick because if there's shrapnel flying, you don't want to be in that standing up. You don't want to be laying down. And so lay down real quick. After everything calms down, go over there and get them. And I'll never forget um, Walton and uh, who else was it? It was somebody else. I think it was Harmon. They get out and they are cussing. They're like, they took my fucking truck. Just, man, this is bullshit. Now I don't have a truck. This is my truck. They freaking took it from me. And I was like, man, why are they so upset? Just be thankful they're alive, you know? Like, I didn't understand their mindset of, why are you so upset your truck is damaged or taken from you whenever you're alive? Like, just be thankful you're alive. Right. Like, I didn't understand that mindset. So how many people are killed in this whole transaction? Uh, No one was killed in this transaction. Um, So this was September 26, 27, and 28. We were out there for three days, like 63 hours worth of actual on-the-road time, according to the Buffalo. And we had, I think, four or five IED strikes within this time frame. Uh, They ended up bringing in another... I think it was like the Royal Army or something like that. And they just brought in this plow and just plowed the whole damn road and found more IDs. We dipped them and then we finally left. Um, and then we finally got to uh, follow Bramrod a day or two later. And meanwhile, if you remember the Huskies, they were still back at Fob Terminator just hanging out. Well, they didn't have anything to do because this was just like this small – pop-up fob in the middle of nowhere. So they didn't have a USO. They didn't have an NWR. They didn't have a laundry system for child. They had MREs. They didn't have anything to actually do all day besides just sit there and talk to one another. So you have these two guys that are still back at base doing nothing, and they can see the route, and they hear all these explosions going off, but they're not tuned in to the radio frequency that we're on, so they don't know what the hell is going on. Right. Okay, so when all this chaos dies down and you guys kind of get back to base to refit and everything, what's the conversation among you and your your fellow soldiers? Uh, I would say it was, um, okay, we really need to start focusing on the attention to detail. We really need to start thinking of where are you going to hide it? Um, That's the biggest question where route clearance ask themselves over and over and over again. Hey, if you have an IED, where are you going to put it at? Where are you going to hide it? If you want to kill somebody with an IED, where are you going to put it? Like you ask yourself this over and over and over again all the time because every situation is a little bit different. But if you're thinking of their mindset, you can think, okay, I would put it here because they're going to be thinking this and this. And now you can help find that IED. So that was more the mindset and, Hey, you know, once we got to Ramrod, I would say life, life got a little bit easier for about um, the month of October. That was an easier month um, just because, hey, we were just going through the motions. We were finding the IEDs instead of getting them struck by default. Mm-hmm. So it was a little bit easier for October, but then November happened. Um, November wasn't a fun month at all. That's where some of the bigger stuff happened. Yeah, okay, so that's where I wanted to get to next. Um, Lead me up to the events before what happens to you on November 4th, 2010. Okay, so uh, on November November 3rd, uh, the day before my ID hit, um, we noticed this MRAP come into the the base. You know, we were pulling um, um, the fast acting, whatever, you know, we were pulling the backup for third platoon at the time. And we noticed this MRAP come into our compound near our houses. You know, some of us have cell phones, so it's not that big of a deal. Hey, if you want to get on somebody's cell phone, you just say, Hey, can I get on your phone for a minute, whatever. And then we notice this MRAP come up and, um, first sergeant gets out of it. I think it was first sergeant. He gets out of it and he locks it. And it's still on. It's still running. I'm like, that's kind of odd. So this is about lunchtime. We go to chow. We come back. And then um, 
we get we kind of have this eerie feeling like everybody's standing around waiting for something. And then um, here comes uh, LT, and he's like, hey, everybody, uh, gather around, get everybody. And, hey, you know, we had some guys at the USO, had to go and get them from the USO, and came back and said, all right, uh, internet's cut out right now. Nobody get on the internet. Nobody get on the phones. Um, we're at uh, Communication Black or Shit Creek, whatever you want to call it. River City is uh, another term. And I was like, okay, so I guess – Somebody got hit. You know, my brother's been to Afghanistan once, Iraq once. I understand what River City is. And uh, we found out that we lost a troop that day from 3rd Platoon. And we didn't know who it was at the time. We didn't know what truck they, they were in. But we knew that we had to go and help recover them. So we get all ready. So on- wait, your LT tells you that you lost somebody and you have to go get them. And no, right. no one's asking who is it, who is it, who is it, or he wouldn't tell you? Or? Um, it, it wasn't that anybody really was worried about that. It was, hey, we don't need to know that right now, so we need to actually go in, help them out. Like, hey, they, they need our help, so we need, we need to go and help them out. Okay. Uh, I was just – I mean, I, you know, yeah. natural curiosity, we want me to know who it is. Not that it necessarily matters one way or another. I'm not yeah, saying I mean, it does. But. Don't get me wrong. We want to know who it was, but at the time, it, it really wasn't a need-to-know basis. I don't remember that being an issue and, like, actually going, hey, you know, we I need, I need to know who this is. Well, it doesn't matter. And we didn't know what kind of truck they were in. We didn't know anything. Uh, all we knew is somebody from 3rd Platoon was – hit and then um we find out i think later that night because we were going to go and go to them at that point but then something happened where they said hey you know uh just come tomorrow morning whenever it's daylight because by the time we got there it was um too late so we just wait until the next day okay to, to get there because uh November 3rd, we uh, were prepping to leave at 1400 and we left at 1506. And then we got to Hazimadad or Azazula at 1837. So, I mean, we were only going nine miles down the road, but it took us three plus hours to get nine miles down the road. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, whenever you say route clearance, you talk about how many hours per mile you go. Because you go that slow. Right. And then, uh, so on November 4th, we wake up at 4.37, and then um, I test the arm out. We, we sleep in the trucks that night. Um, and then we SP at 9. So wake up at 4, we leave at 9. So pretty long time there. But we just eat breakfast on the trucks, and then we SP, which is starting the mission. And then from there... We get to Route Edmonton. Uh, Route Edmonton is, at the time, or was before Third Platoon went down it, a black route. So no one had been down it in over three months. I mean, that's why it was classified as a black route, if I remember right. I could be wrong in the time frame there, but I think it was three months. So no one had been down there in quite some time. Um, so we get uh, on Edmonton around 940, 950, and then... Uh, it's uh, from there. The day seems to really fast forward in my mind, but I'm, I'm just referring to my notes here. Uh, we get on Edmonton uh, around 11. And then from this point, we only go another half mile to a mile down the road. And that's it. And before we get struck by the IED. What do you remember about being hit? Um, I remember moments beforehand, uh, we were looking around and I was like, hey, Alan, I want to dig right up here because we saw this mound of dirt uh, that looked like something was on top of it. And now then looking back on it, it's like, wow, you fucking idiot. You should have known to dig before that mound of dirt because if you dig at that mound of dirt, you're just digging where all the extra dirt was. <laughs> so you need to dig 
before that, not at that mound of dirt because there's nothing there. Or it's maybe, obviously before maybe or after, after that, that mound of dirt. Yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe after or before it. Just not on not the mound. At that, yeah, not on the mound. Well, um, we were both thinking the same thing, dig on the mound of dirt, and he was pulling up in position. And in the video, you can't really tell it, but we were actually slowing down and about to break and stop right there as soon as we get hit. And uh, once it hits, I mean, there was dirt and dust everywhere in that truck. Um, no one was in pain at that point in time. I was just like, motherfucker, we got hit. Like, and that's it. Um, we did, me and Alan both, we had our hatches unlocked on the, uh, we were always told, unlock the hatches on your truck. Because if you do get hit, it'll blow the hatches open instead of you absorbing that concussion and that pressure in your head. Right. So it'll just blow that pressure out versus you absorbing it to your head. So we did that. And then next thing I know, I look up and my hatch is open. I'm like, wow, that's a heavy hatch. I'm like, cause it had to be at least 20 pounds of pressure to push it all the way open. But both his and mine were open. And if you look closely in the video, you can see, both hatches are open after the IED strike, and it's crazy. But I remember our truck commander coming up and checking both of us. We were okay. And then he checked Wilson and Robbins. They were okay. And then he started looking at the floor, and the floor had mushroomed up. And it was like, well, so at this point, the truck was still on, so – um, the AC was not blowing anymore. That turned off. And I was like, well, that's kind of weird. Um, turns out the uh, IED blew off the air conditioning unit and sent it through a wall on the left side and threw it like 500, or not 500, about 50 meters that way. We lost the middle axle. The middle tire on the right side is seen in the video going 50, 60 meters to the right side of the truck. And these are massive tires. They're held on. By like 40, 50 nuts. And they're big tires. They weigh at least five, 600 pounds. And to see that thing just tossed around like a donut is it's nuts. Okay. So are you fine at this point? Like, do you do, do any like sort of a battle damage assessment on your own body? <coughs> um, I do. Um, so I actually took notes on this. Um, I was struggling with my right foot. And my left knee, I had a headache, my back hurt. Um, that's just what I had going on. I mean, my headache that I had from then, I don't think it went away for at least a day or two. But that's it, nothing else? Yeah, nothing else. I mean, my back was hurting, my lower back, and my left knee hit the dash. So as a the arm operator that day, my left knee hit the dash pretty hard during the strike. But that's all I had. And the only bad thing about the entire IED strike, physically, from the five people that were in it, was Robbins, the guy behind me, his left ankle was broken because his left foot was on the center of the floor instead of directly in front of him. And when the IED strike happened, the floor mushroomed up with such force it broke his ankle. Wow. All right, so how do you get out of there? Um, hours later, uh, we started doing, uh, the truck in front of us started doing, uh, control debts. We started doing control debts, line charges to clear from secondaries because we were like, well, if there's a big one like this, there's probably a secondary. So we started clearing out next to us with line charges, things like that. Um, in total for us to get back to Ramrod, we would go on to lose another Buffalo. We would go on to lose four or five more RGs, a Husky, just from this one mission. We lost quite a bit of equipment from the time that we got hit to the next few IED strikes. I mean, I remember at least an, one RG for sure from another platoon and another Buffalo from another platoon. We lost quite a few trucks just on that one mission to help them be recovered. Are are you at this point when you get back? Are you like fearing for your life every day now? 
Uh, I would say quite the opposite. So once we got back, we were told, hey, you know, uh, you're not mission ready for at least a week. So you're just doing whatever you want to do for a week. Just calm down, recover, do whatever. Um, so we went to TMC that day when we got back. And me and Alan both, we were giving profiles for a week saying, hey, you know, here's X, Y, Z. Um, so they did mace tests and all that. And then um, after that week goes by, uh, we were just like, okay, um, let's go back out. Um, but the sad part is, I guess not really sad, but they say, hey, you know, Wilson, you're not going to be in a Buffalo anymore. You're going to be in the back of an RG doing the camera. So, okay, cool. So I was the camera operator for a little bit. And then I was like, hey, you know, can I just be in the Husky? Put me in the Husky. I want to be in the Husky, um, which turned out to be a good thing because that would be my second employment working on the Husky as a contractor. But I didn't even know that at the time. And I got in the Husky and loved it. I love being in the Husky because the Husky is a single-seater vehicle, and you're up front leading the way on this unknown territory. And I love that feeling, that adrenaline rush that came with that. Like, that was – fun for me. I like that. And I also learned how to use the GPR as well, which was fun. But, uh, back to your question of what was my feeling right after we got back. Um, me and Alan, we stood up late that night talking cause we got back to Ramrod at, um, let me see here. We got back pretty late. If I remember right, we got in the gate, um, at like two o'clock in the morning and that was uh, a pretty interesting feeling because we had a convoy of probably 35 40 trucks and we were in the back of an rg we had to cross load get our gear so we never touched the ground during this no matter where we were uh, the truck would always back up to us or pull up in behind us and we would cross load via the truck versus touching the ground. Um, crazy concept looking back on it, but it's like, we're not going to do it. So we'd always cross it that way. And when we got back, me and Alan, we couldn't sleep because it's like, man, we're alive. Like we should be dead right now. No, I mean, listen, that's <laughs> your own mortality kind of smacks you in the face at times. And, uh, Beyond being a wake-up call, it's one of those things where you start to contemplate things a lot, lot differently uh, after you survive that experience. So, Right, and one of the things that I'll kind of touch on is, if you remember me saying, you know, I didn't understand their anger whenever they got hit at the Super Wadi of being mad because their truck was taken away, now I understood that. Like, when we got hit, I was like, the motherfuckers, my truck is gone. They totaled my truck. Like, I understood that now because, like, you put so much time in it, you sleep in it, you trust it, it it helps you out, it never fails, it's a good truck, and then all of a sudden it's gone and taken from you? Like, man, I, I got that then. But I never understood why you would be mad at somebody for blowing something up that saved your life. Right. Now, this actual event is on YouTube. There's video it, of the explosion. How did correct. you come to find out that was you, and how would you find out about the video? Uh, from what I understand, um, there was a civilian contractor watching the footage. I don't know their name. I don't even know what company they worked for, but there was a civilian contractor that when we got back from that mission, uh, they came up to a bunch of us with thumb drives and said, Hey, you might want this. And we didn't really know what it was. We just knew, all right, well, it's whatever. Uh, well, we pulled it up on the computer and it was footage of us not only getting hit, but it was footage of the people who placed that IED. And I was like, well, why didn't they freaking tell us, Hey, stop right there and dig. You'll find an IED. Like that upset me quite a bit because someone knew where that IED was before we drove over that place on earth and they watched us get hit. 
so that that upset me quite a bit. Um, but then we watch more of the videos that were on there, and needless to say, we ended up getting our revenge on them. You did personally, or other guys did? Uh, from what I understand, it was probably drone strikes. Mm-hmm. From what I understand, um, but they were quite talented in the way they were doing things. The way I explain it to other people right now is imagine you're in a large farming community and you're all part of an HOA and this unknown entity comes in and says, Hey, we're going to just drive through all of your farms and set up a base and take some of your land until we decide to give it back. Meanwhile, you aren't able to farm that land. You don't have access to that land. And they tore up your crop. They're not going to give you any kind of money or anything back because they destroyed your land. But yet you can't even touch them because if you touch them, they're powerful and they'll kill you. Well, that's not going to make you feel real warm and fuzzy inside. Sure. So you and the other farmers say, you know what? We together are going to start putting in IEDs and start hurting them. And then maybe they'll freaking leave. So, I mean, that's what they're thinking, and I, I understand they're thinking, and I can emphasize, emphasize, emphasize with them that, that that's what I would think. Sure. Now, this deployment ends, and ultimately you get out of the military. Why did you decide to get out, and, and then eventually you end up actually going back as a contractor? So how does that whole story unfold? So when I was in Afghanistan the first time, I started learning more about the Husky. I spent a lot of time with the folks over at NITEC. I uh, probably put in 80, 90 hours or so just working with them hand in hand when I wasn't doing missions and then worked with them a little bit, became on first name basis and got their contact information. And they, one of them told me how to put it on their, on my resume and how that would look as a contractor looking for an applicant. And I was like, okay, so that's cool. I'll just do that. So I got back from Afghanistan and then I got back in March of 2010, and I started contracting March of 2012. So there's about a year and a half there where I was applying for jobs, not getting them, applying for another job, not getting it. Um, and then finally, my brother was in contact with this company called Critical Solutions International, and he knew a guy named Daryl, and Daryl was like, hey, you know, let me look at your resume. I sent it to him, and he's like, all right, well, I, I'll send it to my boss named AJ. And this was probably summer of 2011, so it had been over a year of me being unemployed, just drilling and looking for a job. And I finally get a call on Christmas Day 2011 saying, hey, are you still interested in being a contractor with us, or, or are you still looking for a job? And I said, yes, sir, I am. He's like, okay, well, have a wonderful Christmas night, and I'll be in contact with you here in a few weeks after the first of the year, and we'll start talking from there. Um, about a month later, I flew down to Dallas for an interview in Carrollton, Texas, and then got the job, moved down to Texas in 2012 in March, and been down in Texas ever since. And then part of that job was I was going to have to be a civilian contractor working on the Husky, and then I went back to Afghanistan 2013 in, I want to say, early September, and then came back in May. So did another deployment working with Marines, though, in Afghanistan. What's the best part about being deployed as a contractor that you and the things you can't do as an actual service member? Uh, so I was not allowed to touch a weapon. Uh, that's one of the first things that comes to mind is I was never allowed to touch a weapon as a contractor. Um, that's a fireable offense, and they drill that into your head. Do not touch a weapon. You will get fired. So um, if there's a vehicle that has a weapon in it, ask the Marine, sir, I need you to get your weapon out before I can work on the truck. Um, so that was kind of weird because I came from a mentality of, if a weapon's left unsecured, secure it. Mm-hmm. Like that, so that's a big contrast. Um, <clears throat> one of the best parts about being a civilian is we had vehicles we could drive to Chow. 
instead of walk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was on, I was on Leatherneck. So Leatherneck is big. Yeah. So, and I was an American. So I had all access no matter what. So I could go to any chow hall. I could go pretty much anywhere I wanted to any time of day as a civilian. The first night I was there, I got pulled over by a PMO for speeding. And I was like, really? Like, um, the only reason I didn't get a ticket or getting written up for my employer, which they can do, they said, Oh, you got here today. Like the ID card that I had said today's date. And he was like, Oh, you literally just got here. Didn't you? I was like, yes, <laughs> I did. I didn't know there was a speed limit here. He's like, yes, you can drive like 15 kilometers per hour or whatever the outrageously low speed limit sign mm-hmm. is. And so I learned that, but one of the, more interesting things is, yeah, I could grow a beard out and all that. I wasn't really, um, how how do I say it? There was no uniform policy. Like I could grow a beard. I could, as long as I wear steel toe boots, long pants and a polo or work shirt, I'm good. Right. Um, but I could also work out when I wanted to. Uh, but the thing is, as, if there's work to be done, do the work. Work comes above all. And it was really weird because me and Matt, the guy I came to country with, we all lived, or we being me and him, we lived in housing in the container lot, which is the basically the compound with all the housing units. Right. The, uh, if anybody's been to Leatherneck, they know what I'm talking about because it's just this apartment complex, basically, out of shipping containers. So we lived over there, but my work was two blocks away. So I would just walk to chow then walk over there to that um but if there was work i wouldn't know until i got there so how would i how was i supposed to know if work is there if i can't talk and communicate with them via cell phone and i wasn't gonna get a cell phone so that was weird um but i mean i got to know all the marines i worked with i got to know the drivers and i mean i took a lot of pride in the stuff i did i would clean up the Huskies cab a lot more than any other contractor because I would take the seat out, clean the wires, give them a lot more room in the Husky because I was a Husky operator. And if there's wires blocking somewhere where you can put a monster drink or an extra bottle to piss in, well, that makes their life a lot easier and they're more likely to take better care of their own truck. So I was doing all this extra stuff all the time for them. All right, so let's fast forward here. You finish your time there as a contractor, and you move on completely away from military life at this point. And yet it takes you nearly a decade to end up being awarded your Purple Heart for what happened to you on November 4th, 2010. What happened and why, and why did it take so long? Oh, man. So this is another interesting story of how all this unfolded. Um, So as you've seen the video on YouTube, I've shown it to a lot of people, Um. Command Sergeant Major Brian Flom, he's a friend of mine, and he's seen the video, and he's like, hey, so are you, did you get the Purple Heart for that? And I was like, no. And he's like, why not? And I was like, that's a good question. My command put in for it, and it was declined, and he was like, you need to do your own paperwork for that. So I had to, this was back in 2015 when he told me that, and I mean, I had gone through the multiple steps. I had to get three eyewitness accounts that were people that were there. So I had to contact people that I knew that were there on that day that were hopefully still alive. Okay. Write me an eyewitness account and have that notarized by the way for free. Like I'm not going to pay you anything for that, but please do that on your own time and make it worthy. Like write all the de- details and we started referencing my journal because I took detailed notes of all that with maps and all that. And then not only did I need that, I needed my line of duty, which I still have, which is saying, hey, this doctor saw me on this date because of this incident and this was my injuries. So I had to have that. And then I had to have like my personal narrative and all of that had to be seen in a nice little package. Well, I sent it in, and they declined it. And I was like, well, damn, man. I can't do anything more. And then another year or two pass, and then uh, somebody else starts hounding me about it. I think it was my brother at this time. He was like, Terry, just freaking do the paperwork. It's worth it. Just do the paperwork. 
And I end up saying, okay, here's where the fault was. The fault at this, the last time was, um, the LOD wasn't enough evidence. And I'm like, look at the dang gum video. It's enough evidence. And so I was like, okay, I look at the LOD and I was like, okay, um, here's the doctor that actually saw me in Afghanistan. I find his cell phone number online. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried to find somebody's cell phone number that might be alive that you saw almost a decade ago Yeah, and saying, Hey, um, sir, is this Dr. So-and-so that was on this fob on this date in Afghanistan? And he was like, yes, this is he. How can I help you? I'm like, well, um, you saw me on this date saying that I suffered the X, Y, and Z, which is uh, traumatic brain injury, back injury, leg injury from the IED strike. And he was like, uh, I've slept since then, but if you have something with my name on it that I signed with my stamp or my signature, I'll write up a narrative for you. And I was like, okay, I have that. He's like, oh, you do? Okay, well, go ahead and send me the picture of that. And one of the smartest things that I did whenever I got back from Afghanistan was I signed my L- – or I scanned my LODs and my journals right then. So I have a scanned copy of all my documents with fresh ink because if anybody knows, documentation fades over time. It had fresh inked LOD with all the stuff instead of it fading. So I sent him that, and about four or five days later, I get an email and a text saying, hey, I just sent you that. Let me know if you need anything else. And he was referencing the journal of this is why he deserves this. This is equal to this. Like He wrote the narrative with all the evidence needed for the Purple Heart. And this was – Back in, I think, September, I got that. And then I was waiting on some other documentation to send in. So I sent in all the documentation in February. And then I find out via a phone call from my congressman uh, on opening day of baseball, because that's where we're headed. Hey, uh, is this Terry Wilson? Yes, sir. He's like, this is Congressman Van Taylor. I just want to let you know your Purple Heart paperwork has been approved and you will be awarded the Purple Heart. I uh, just want to say not really congratulations, but it's going to be an honor to give this award to you because he was a Marine. He knows like this is not the award that you want to be congratulated on getting, but hey, this is something that's worthy of being given. Right. And it's reflective of your service and what you did. So from that standpoint, uh, an incredible honor. How did you feel? What were you thinking? I was like, man, finally, like all this paperwork was finally done. It was, I'm finally going to be able to open a few doors that were previously closed. Um, one of those doors being, uh, if you go back to me and uh, command Sergeant major flom, um, he is able to do, he, he, Command Sergeant Major Flom also has the Purple Heart, and he's able to do President Bush's mountain bike ride every year because he has the Purple Heart. And I was like, well, I want to do that. And he's like, well, you have to have the Purple Heart. And I was like, well, I don't have that. And now that's going to open that door for me to actually be able to go and ride mountain bikes with all these other veterans. And there's a few other doors as far as uh, tuition that goes because I recently graduated college that – will help along with all that other stuff. So when you reflect back on all this, you know, your journey, uh, not only through the military, but, you know, to the Purple Heart and beyond, what sticks out to you? Um, One of the things that sticks out to me was I was actually able to visit Cop Wrath. Um, Cop Wrath was in in the Ken Hart province and, Something about Cop Wrath is, well, I didn't touch on earlier, but January 6th in 2009, my best friend from high school was killed in Afghanistan, and he was killed in uh, the hotel area, H-O-T-E-L, in Afghanistan. 
And then I was actually able to go and visit the five where he stayed. And that was pretty awesome to go to his vibe. So that was probably one of the highlights that I got to see is see where he stayed, the gym he went to, the defect he ate at, the NWR he actually got to see. Like, I was actually able to see that. Like, you can't put a price tag on that, I don't think. And then some of the other highlights was, yeah, I got blown up, but I still had a blast, no pun intended. Like, I had fun with all my friends in Afghanistan the first time, and the second time, I had a lot of fun with the civilians I made friends with. Well, look, I mean, there is a certain amount of fun isn't always the word people would associate with, but there is a certain amount of enjoyment you can have from doing a job, doing it well, uh, and living to tell about it in that environment. You know, I mean, you, you can reflect back fondly on those memories. Right. And one of the things that I got to see is the direct result of us clearing routes. Um, I knew that we were providing food and supplies for other troops in Afghanistan. And even though I didn't see that when we first got there up east in Jalalabad, when we got down south, we could see that a lot more clear because they were following us most of the time. Oh, gotcha. The supplies were like almost embedded with us. Makes sense. Certainly an incredible story, and you're here to tell about it, and that's you know a blessing to say the least, but the fact that you share your story, it's inspirational to others uh, and that, you, that you're able to tell your story and remind us of those who aren't able to tell their story. Well, I appreciate your time. And um, uh, I do have to actually mention that the soldier that made this ultimate sacrifice on November 3rd is James Chad Young, and he was with 3rd Platoon. And uh, I've met him a few times, and he was a great guy. He really was. How much of him stays with you every day? Um, I wouldn't say every day because he wasn't in my platoon and I didn't know him like the people within my platoon. But every November 3rd, you know, I take him in and I say a little prayer for him and his family. I mean, it means a lot. Certainly does. Well, Terry, again, thank you so much for sharing your story with us and and being part of the hazard ground. And certainly, you know, thank you for your honesty, but can't thank you enough for being part of the show. You're welcome. You've been listening to the hazard ground podcast hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.